So as far as I know... On this edition of Native Report, we tour all my relations gallery. First and only three-dimensional bandolier bay. We attend the National Congress of American Indians annual convention. And we conclude the series of Barrel Whalers of the North. We also learn something new about Indian Country and hear from our elders on this Native Report. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Medwakanton Sioux Community, the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe, and the Blandin Foundation. Hi, welcome to Native Report. I'm Stacy Thunder. In the heart of Minneapolis's American Indian Cultural Corridor, All My Relations Gallery opened its doors in 2011. The gallery presents a new exhibit of contemporary Native American fine art on a quarterly basis. On this overcast fall day, all My Relations Gallery offers patrons an opportunity to view a visually diverse selection of Native American fine art. The current exhibit, the title is Mini Shota, Reflections of Time and Place. And the exhibit was, uh, is funded through the Minnesota State Arts Board Touring Exhibition of Traditional and Folk Arts Grant. Because it's labeled and it's, it's put under this traditional and folk arts um, category, we wanted to make sure that we were able to define those notions of traditional um, and folk arts through our own lens. There's still a great deal of um, stereotypes that you know people tend to think with. They think of native arts. They're still believed to be beads and feathers and to mimic arts that would have been being produced in the late 1800s, early 1900s. That idea is still fairly frozen in time. And, as an artist myself, I, I, I know that and I've experienced it and I know that it's something that those misconceptions are still there. Pieces done in the traditional manner, quill work on a brain tanned hide for example, sit alongside art with a more modern touch, such as graffiti on skateboards. We concentrated on moments of innovation, acknowledging moments of innovation telling the story about how, you know, beadwork, we see that beadwork as a traditional art form now. Most people see that as a traditional art form, but recognizing the fact that when that moment, when um, individuals decided to take beads and apply them to art forms that were already being produced, that were being done in quills, um, that that moment that the people took it and, and obviously ran with it and successfully so, that that was a moment of innovation. Every time a new material has been introduced, um, you know, our, our ancestors and ourselves celebrate that. You know, wool is an excellent example, cotton fabric, um, trade items, you know, once they were, became available, pieces of metal, different, you know, so many things have been incorporated into, um, into an already established system. And what those things do is they, they support and they become elements to continue what we're posing as the tradition here is really the content, the meaning, the stories that are in those pieces, the life ways that are created that um, are continued to be told. We're hoping that people will see the visual link from piece to piece to piece to piece and acknowledge the fact that all of those moments are important for cultural continuity. The most traditional modes of making, we need those to continue as we need the most innovative modes of making as well, because they all become a part of our story and our history. This is um, Cecile Taylor. Cecile Taylor is Spirit Lake Dakota and Turtle Mountain Band of Ojibwe. And Cecile is, um, and she has perfected her own unique style of three-dimensional beadwork. 
and she usually does one um, you know single pieces it'll be a single three-dimensional flower that will become a barrette or a hairpiece or something of the sort so for this exhibit uh, we approached Cecile and we asked her if she um, would be willing to take that art form to um, the next level and if she'd you know be willing to really expand on um, an art form that she's already um, perfected you know with the three-dimensional works uh, we brought her into the Minnesota State, um, or we brought her to the Minneapolis Institute of Arts into the collections and showed her examples of old bandolier bags. And she was so excited about what she saw that she decided that she wanted to make a three-dimensional bandolier bag. Melvin Lash is from the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe, and Melvin is an amazing quill worker. He, along with beadworker, he. Um, is an individual who is practicing an art form that doesn't necessarily come from Ojibwe people. It's a tradition that's closely related to Micmac and their area, but he was taught by um, a woman that he highly respects from that area, and his expertise really shows. If you really study these pieces and look at their intricacy and the, the amount of perfection that he's able to achieve, this is a very challenging form of artwork. It's uh, extremely technical. I'm particularly excited about Bobby Wilson's skateboards. Skateboard culture and graffiti culture inspire him just as much as his Dakota culture. That all parts of that all of those things are a part of who he is and what makes up his personal history and that he fully embraces those and he's not necessarily trying to be all one or the other. While Diani can give gallery patrons her interpretation, viewers can hear directly from the artists themselves. We've um, interviewed each of our 17 artists and we've condensed our interviews down to two to two and a half minute um, segments that you can walk around the gallery with these Toshiba touch pads and a set of headphones and you can scroll through as you approach a piece of art you can find the artist on the list and listen to them speak about their work you know you get to see their excitement their passion their inspiration you get a little introduction to who they are to um, their process and their environment We've been able to pull individuals together that have um, a wide variety of experience. Some, some of our artists have um, been very immersed in the art scene. They know, um, they know what it means to exhibit in a gallery, in a museum, they're part of collections, they know how to write artist statements, things of the sort. And some of our other artists are well known in the community um, and haven't had that previous experience. but they deserve the accolades just as much as those who have been full participants. So this exhibit has really been a gift for us, um, all of us involved, the artists, those of us that got to put it together, those of us that get to visit it, and really get to see a wide variety of people that might not necessarily be exhibited in this manner. Being able to bring all of those different types of people and artists together has been really exciting. Did you know the All My Relations Gallery features contemporary American Indian fine art exhibits? The mission of the gallery is to strengthen and honor relationships between contemporary artists and the living influence of preceding generations. Another goal is to strengthen relationships between artists and audiences of all ethnic backgrounds. The gallery envisions a community in which American Indian and non-Indian audiences have broad access to quality American Indian art that presents the American Indian experience in all its diversity. The gallery also envisions that Minneapolis and the American Indian Cultural Corridor will be known as an important national destination for American Indian art and artists and a place for those who appreciate art. Finally, the gallery seeks to increase the visibility of American Indian art, history, and culture.
The annual convention of the National Congress of American Indians is a week-long event focusing on legislative issues affecting many Native nations across Indian Country. It's a time to show unity, to network, and to fulfill the promises made to future generations. For one week each year, a major metropolitan city in the United States hosts the National Congress of American Indians Annual Convention and Marketplace, one of Indian Country's largest key gatherings. In just 31 days, 31 days, we will be meeting again with President Obama to deliver a message from Indian Country. And this morning, we're hoping to gather as, as members of the National Congress of American Indians to formulate our message, our message. And we want to be able to create an opportunity where every table, there's a, a chance to hear the voice of Indian country and to connect that voice with a unified message that we could deliver in just 31 days. As you'll recall, at last year's annual meeting, we posed the question, what are the one are two things that we could deliver to President Obama. So this year, again, once again, we want to reach out, directly engage uh, tribal leadership from throughout the country to identify those issues so that we can then once again refine a message, a unified message. So it's critical. This is a critical time uh, to come together. The convention is where tribal leaders, their staff, and federal agency representatives discuss various policies and programs this year one such topic is suicide prevention. We are committed to addressing the problem of suicide and uh, particularly we're aware of the situation in Alaska. Um, we have engaged with the National Alliance for Suicide Prevention so we've been very active and we were one of the co-sponsors for a national summit on suicide prevention. Having said that, when it comes to the budget, there is a principle that we try very hard to, to uh, connect with and adhere to, and that is consultation with tribal leaders through the Tribal Interior Budget Council. So that's where I get my instructions. We are personally committed to addressing this, but we need to make sure that that continues to be a priority for that council. Another topic for discussion is the treaty rights of tribes along the northwest coast. We are the only ones really out there that are trying to protect the salmon. But the, the state of Washington, for instance, I think they have, they, they like to talk a big line about restoring salmon. And, they, and I think they have a lot of natural resources managers that would like to restore salmon runs. But when you look at projections of the growth in Puget Sound of being a million or a million and a half more people here by 2025, it doesn't speak well for protecting salmon. It speaks to more urban sprawl, more diversion of water out of those streams, bigger, more, you know, things like dikes and dams to support that kind of infrastructure. And the almighty dollar wins out. The salmon don't win. Another issue brought forward deals with the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act and possible termination of Alaska tribes. We no longer can practice our ways, which are very good, very ethical standards, moral ways of helping each other, treating each other and dependent mostly on the lands and waters. And today, that is still the same. And yet, the ANCSA law has terminated our hunting and fishing rights. And our children that were born after December 18, 1971 has been severed from us. We have 230 tribes in Alaska. And many of those small tribes can't afford to come to these meetings. A National Congress of American Indians is the rightful place for these tribes to come and be able to speak with other lower 48 tribes, but they can't. And there's only a handful of us here. The message is to the listeners that you must come and help the Alaska Natives. And then whatever happens to Alaska Natives, ANCSA being one of the biggest and greatest termination acts on American Indians, 
we must unite together, the Alaskan tribes and the lower 48, because whatever happens in Alaska will surely come back and terrorize the lower 48 tribes. For over 70 years, NCAI has set the course of tribal policy, strengthening Indian country and protecting tribal sovereignty. I'm going to pause for just a minute in, in the uh, program to make some announcements because we need to acknowledge those who have who've helped us to uh, get to the point where we are today. To all the tribal chairmen, presidents, and general managers, thank you for your sponsorship and support. We'd like to thank Key Bank and the The 68th annual NCAI Convention and Marketplace in Portland, Oregon, featured a number of speakers, breakout sessions, and other events for attendees to experience. The week-long event is a time to show unity across Indian country, a time for many to network, to renew old acquaintances, and to make new ones. A marketplace is also part of the convention, where artisans, businesses, and nonprofit organizations from across the United States can showcase their respective talents and provide valuable information on a variety of native issues. I wouldn't be here if it weren't for my ancestors. I wouldn't be here if not for my elders. When I was a young man and I first went to ceremony, people welcomed me. It was like they could see something in me I couldn't see. And most of those people are gone, so they're my ancestors now too. And you know, here I am, I'm uh, Considered to be an el a young elder, I'm told. You know, I heard Russell Mean say that Lakota male at life expectancy was 44 and a half years, or something like that. I'm 12 years beyond that. I'm, I, you know, I'm not about leaving a legacy or. Anything. I'm interested in the life of the people so that the people will live. I do this so that the people will live. That's an old saying. Next, we conclude Season 7 of Native Report with the final installment of Barrel Whalers of the North. We thank producer Jeannie Green for allowing us to broadcast her documentary about the enduring ways of the Inupiat. When the gear has been packed away and the area picked up, the tired people return to the shores of Barrow where the captain begins dividing the meat and muktuk up into portions. Uh, right there, that running right there. As the captain starts to delegate portions, the crew's flag is brought in from the ice and a hauler goes out across the shore. Exhausted and hungry, Captain Henry Kignick is relieved of duty by his wife, Juanita, who has no problem getting these tired workers back into high gear. Right there, right there, those ones right there. He's got the mark right here already, so you guys have to take those ones that way. Hey, 
giving it out to other um, all those guys who've been working out there all night. That's what we do for a living. Now it's a hard work, no matter what we go through. Uh, all we do is just divide it, make sure everybody get all the share. At the end of it all, people's names are called, and they choose which pile of muktuk and meat they want by standing next to it. As the night winds down, Henry and his family load their catch into the truck and prepare to call it a day. Waiting patiently until the lead goes out and the remaining whale can be harvested. The following morning, crews have headed back out to the whaling site. The ice has shifted and this small group of whalers is going to try and bring the rest of the whale up on the ice pack. But as unpredictable as nature is, the west winds kick up and force the ice flow back towards the shore, slowly but surely burying the whale again. I want to pin him out. He's down the roof. Where's the hook? We need a hook. With what little time they had, these people managed to get a great deal of muktuk off the whale before the ice stopped all progress. Since the whale belongs to the captain, he or his wife must be called out to the site so that the muktuk can be divided up between those who harvested the whale today. Maybe go, go get those other two this way. Yeah, in a, make, make a row like that. Yeah, there you go, like that. Something on that. Two more. Two more, take a one more. With such a small group present, the shares will be generous. While the action is settling down on the ice, it's just beginning for Henry Kignick and his family. Yeah. <laughs> we're gonna be we're gonna be cutting and serving today. Look like we got oh my auntie coming in. What we're doing here is we're cooking all the muktuk, making new lolly for a serving. We'll be serving the community tonight or when, the, when we're ready. Everybody come and get a good meal for their belly. It's very delicious. And uh, this is a serving for tonight that we'll be doing. And uh, after we're done with serving with all this is comes next is the Apuwadi Eskimo picnic, which will be served uh, Mickey up. But here, this is right when they're done with cutting up the whale, they serve right away when we're ready. And it's gonna be a good meal. Come on, come on. It's been said, it takes a village to raise a child. Truth be known. It takes a village working together to survive in the nation's northernmost community. It's the afternoon of June 2nd, 2003. To the people of the far north, it's another day to hunt, another day to feast, another day to carry on the Anupiaq way of life like they did the year before, and the year before that, and the year before that.
in the year before that. In the year before that. For more information about Native Report or the stories we've covered, look for us on the web at nativereport.org and on Facebook. Thank you for spending this time with your friends and neighbors during this seventh season of Native Report. I'm Stacy Thunder. We'll see you next time. Stacy Thunder is a member of and legal counsel for the Red Lake Nation, and Tad Johnson is a member of the Boys Fort Band of Chippewa and is chair for the American Indian Studies Department on the campus of the University of Minnesota Duluth. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Medwakanton Sioux Community, the Malax Band of Ojibwe, and the Blandin Foundation. <laughs>